Uh, welcome back to the Canadian Concussion Center's uh, webinar series, which is sponsored by LIUNA, the Labour's International Union of North America. My name is Leslie Rattan, and I'm really pleased to be moderating our series, which is running every other week on Tuesday evenings. And if you've been with us before, you know that we start off with a, a talk. We have an expert speaker who will speak for about the first half of the session, and then we open it up to question uh, and answer for the second half. If you have missed any of our previous sessions, uh, you can actually find all of those recorded on our website and uh, look for the link uh, in the chat. Uh, and also for this evening's talk, if you just uh, look to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a Q&A. So if you do have any questions for our speaker, please enter them there. If you're having any kind of technical difficulties, please enter those into the chat and Christian uh, will get back to you and, uh, and help you out. So at this time, we usually just run a quick poll uh, to get a sense of who is in our audience. So I'll just wait a second for Christian to bring that up and give you a second to indicate who you are. Thanks so much. So for this evening's session, I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Andrea Para, uh, and she's going to be uh, talking about imaging in concussion. Dr. Para obtained her master's degree in medical biophysics and medical doctorate at the University of Toronto, followed by residency in diagnostic radiology at Western University and diagnostic neuroradiology fellowship at Yale University. She is now a diagnostic neuroradiologist in the Joint Department of Medical Imaging and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Dr. Pera's interests are in advanced neuroimaging, medical education, and quality improvement. Her focus is on the clinical application of advanced neuroimaging techniques such as CVR, MRI perfusion, fMRI, quantitative MRI, and artificial intelligence. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Para. All right, thank you, Dr. Rutan, for that lovely introduction. Um, so I will be speaking today on imaging in concussion. I don't have any disclosures. And just a bit of an outline, I'll start by talking about some of the brain structures um, and then talk about findings in concussion injury. Um, what imaging tools we have available both routinely um, in clinical practice now and what is um, more in the research realm, but on the horizon, and then the limitations of these tools. Um, so as we all know, the brain is a very complex structure with multiple interconnected components composed of neurons, then the other cell types that support the neurons, as well as blood vessels. When somebody experiences a traumatic injury, blow to the head, this causes sheer force and stretching on these brain structures. And there can be multiple sequelae of this involving the endothelium and blood vessels involving the axons, microtubules, um, cell membranes, and the glial cells. And all of these have complex downstream effects. And there's a lot of interaction between these um, different components. And it all kind of comes together with a failure in neuronal function um, where the patient then experiences um, cognitive symptoms. So after head trauma, we kind of have two main categories of um, imaging and clinical syndromes. So in concussion, there's injury to the cells but they remain intact. And so this is a microstructural injury um, versus other brain injuries where the cells are so damaged that it results in cell death. This is when we can see macrostructural injuries um, such as bleeding or contusions. So in traumatic brain injury, the um, main issue is that there's injury to the axons known as diffuse axonal injury. And then this can result in a couple of findings that we can actually see on imaging. We can see these white matter hyperintensities. We can see areas of hemorrhage. And then later on, um, 
we can see the sequela of contusions where here we have some encephalomalacia where um, basically the image is the same as CSF, like there's no more tissue there. And then there's area of gliosis that's also white and that's um, more areas of scarring. It's possible that there could be some functional brain tissue there, but it's probably not functioning at its like optimum capacity. So even if we look at patients who've had a traumatic brain injury and then they've recovered, we can still see sequela of that um, down the road where um, the study of patients of moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, um, most of the patients showed more atrophy um, in at least one area of the brain compared to normal controls. So even though clinically they've recovered, we can still see evidence of that later. And so there could be some underlying um, clinical symptoms that are just kind of subclinical and not recognized. So in imaging of concussion, the extent of the structural injury and its functional consequences are not fully understood. Um, current imaging techniques focus mostly on those macro structural injuries um, and to a lesser extent on things like blood vessels and blood flow. Um, and then we don't have a very good understanding of how these findings change over time and how that relates to the clinical course. Um, this presents a very big challenge in detecting concussion with imaging techniques. So there have been a lot of different studies using different modalities um, beyond our kind of regular CT and MRI, um, including uh, PET scans, SPEC scans, functional MRI, um, EEG, and magnetoencephalography. And all of these kind of have their pros and cons of the different approaches. Um, the concussion imaging problem is that the more severe injury is easy to see on MRI, but concussion is very difficult to see. Structural concussive injury is microscopic and sparse. We're looking for really small changes in a vastly complex brain with billions of neurons. Just like an astronomer, looking for a tiny new planet in our universe with 100 billion stars. This has become easier with powerful telescopes and computers. Advanced imaging combined with powerful computing hold great promise. Um, this is a micrographic image of the brain cells and we can see that um, this is 50 micros microns. So the structures that we're looking at are incredibly small. Um, whereas on MRI, um, the 3D pixel or a voxel is about one to three millimeters. So one of these voxels will encounter, encompass like a very large volume of structures comparatively. So all that signal gets averaged in together. So then when we're trying to find the injury to maybe one or two of these cells amongst this whole background of other cells that are relatively normal, we're really looking for like a needle in a haystack essentially. So what do we see on imaging in concussion? So CT is kind of the workhorse in neuroradiology, especially in the acute setting and the emergency room. Um, and in concussion, CT scans should be normal. There shouldn't be any signs of hemorrhage or other injury. And usually this is done to rule out those more severe injuries that then would be classified if there is hemorrhage and other things as a traumatic brain injury. But then some of these patients that are normal go on to have an MRI. And 30% of patients with a normal CT scan and a Glasgow coma scale of 15, meaning that they didn't have any loss of consciousness um, and they're fully alert and awake. So 30% of those patients do end up having subtle findings on MRI, like I talked about before, the white matter hyperintensities or small hemorrhages. Um, but concussion, these patients have a normal MRI. So in a study of 127 patients with post-concussive syndrome, um, they were compared with 29 controls um, who underwent MRI brain at 3T. 
and the images were assessed to look at areas of abnormal signal, either in the white matter, signs of um, scarring, um, atrophy, prior hemorrhages. And in the concussions, 97% of the patients had MRIs that were indistinguishable from healthy controls, as in that they didn't have any of these findings. So the presence, as I've said before, of blood or atrophy indicates that there was some sort of more severe form of injury. Um, So some other imaging modalities that there's a lot of um, clinical interest in, um, one of being SPECT, which stands for Single Photon Emission Community Tomography. So this is clinically used routinely in the diagnosis of epilepsy and dementia, and there's been great interest in using it in concussion, but it's not quite ready for um, clinical application at this time. Um, the SPECT scan involves injection of a tracer, and this is used to measure cerebral blood flow. This is an example of a SPECT scan in normal patients. Um, and we can see the tracer uptake here in red is brighter in the cortex and the gray matter um, compared to the white matter. And when you're looking at these normal patients, there are still variations between people with little areas that are slightly asymmetric or slightly hotter or colder. Um, and then if you're trying to compare that to patients, it's really hard to tell what falls within that range of normal variation that we would see in a healthy population versus trying to seek out that variation that's caused by whatever disease that you're trying to understand. Um, so in a study that was done with SPECT and mild traumatic brain injury, um, this study found that, as I said, in CT and MRI, the, the findings are usually um, not very common. So in CT, 4.5% of the patients had an abnormality. MRI was a bit more sensitive in picking up abnormalities at 9%, but SPECT CT had about half the patients had abnormal results. Um, another study showed that um, changes in blood flow, meaning lower blood flow in this case, had been identified as early as 24 hours after injury and up to three years after injury. But when only about 50% of the images are positive, it can be hard to figure out where it's almost like flipping a coin, whether it's going to be positive or negative. So it's still not getting up to the sensitivity and specificity that we need in kind of the high 90 or at least in the 90s, um, to make it a reliable test. Um, and another confounding factor is that it's known that in other medical conditions, such as migraine, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, can result in alterations in SPECT imaging that could be confused with the similar findings in traumatic brain injury. So um, it, it might work if the person has no other medical history, but a lot of people do have more, um, can have other things going on in their lives. Um, so another issue with SPECT is that it is really um, quite subjective, especially as it stands right now in clinical practice. There's a lot of research going on about standardization and how the data is acquired and how it's analyzed to allow it to be more objective and provide um, quantitative measurements. So some effort has been put into towards developing a way of scoring um, these scans mathematically. And so you do this by building a database of normal healthy controls. And we take all the information gathered from those studies and that will give us an average or a mean. And then it'll give us an estimate of how much variability is there in a normal population. And for most um, phenomena that follow a normal distribution, there's going to be a peak in the middle. And then um, some patients who are a little bit um, different than the average. And we usually classify normal as being within two standard deviations of the mean. And then the um, little tails out here would be ones that are thought to fall kind of out of the range of normal. So 95% of patients would fall within these two standard deviations. So 
some of these atlases are built um, where you take the images from a lot of different patients and then you map it on to kind of a standard brain template. And that way you can average the data, even if everybody's brain is a little bit different in shape, it's a way to um, kind of standardize everything. And then you can measure um, different measurements in different anatomical locations. Um, and in this case, it shows that there's um, higher uptake in the cortex, as we saw on the other side, and then um, lower uptake in the white matter. Um, so there have been efforts to um, make clinical uh, programs to take advantage of this approach. One, um, this is software from GE that allows you to map the findings onto images of the brain. And then it also breaks it down by the different um, areas in the brain and gives you an estimate of, are these within that normal range of two standard deviations or are they below that? And for this patient, we can see like if normal's in the middle and then two is here. So all these kind of boxes here are areas that are below two standard deviations, or they're lower than what would be found in 95% of the population. Um, one of the areas that jumps out is the right temporal pole. And we know because of that area um, where it is next to the skull base, it's one of the areas that can commonly be injured. Um, and we often see contusions there. Um, the drawback to this is that it's not widely available. I don't think it, there's been a lot of um, clinical uptake. So maybe some of these things are coming down the road in the future, but they're not quite there yet. Um, there's also been efforts on SPEC to use different tracers that can measure different things other than just blood flow. And so this tracer is targeted towards the microglia and they're known to be involved in the inflammatory process. And um, after traumatic brain injury, there is uptake scene, increased uptake seen at one to two weeks post-injury. And then in patients who have per persistent concussive syndromes, they can still show uptake later at three and four months post-injury. So then can any other advanced neuroimaging techniques do any better? So there are a lot of different areas that are being investigated, including um, measuring the brain volumes or cortical thickness, looking at diffusion tensor imaging, like looking at the tracks within the brain, looking at resting state connectivity, and looking at uh, the health of the blood vessels and the cerebrovascular reactivity. So this was a post-mortem study done at 7T. So that's seven Tesla, usually in clinical practice, most of the magnets in use are either 1.5 or 3T. So this is a very strong magnet that allows you to get incredibly high resolution detailed images. These almost look like a pathology specimen rather than an image. Um, and in this study, they looked at um, football players who had had a history of multiple concussions. Um, and this one didn't show a lot of changes um, in terms of brain volumes, but they did show a possible um, decrease in the hippocampal size. Um, another study that did show some other differences in brain volumes, this was in uh, military service members who had been exposed to um, blast injuries from like either firing weapons or things landing near them, um, working around loud machinery. And um, this population was compared to normal healthy controls. And these are areas that showed increased atrophy compared to the normal controls. And they also looked at the correlation between the brain volumes and the patient age and compared that to the normal controls. So the yellow line or all the yellow dots here are normal controls. And this is the change in um, volume expected over time. And then in the patients who had this history of traumatic brain injury, we can see that 
there's a lot of overlap. Like a lot of these individual dots are kind of in the same area, but when we have this larger group of data, we can um, look at the trend over time and the slope is steeper. So their atrophy is occurring at a faster rate than the normal population. So this is kind of one of the challenges of a lot of these studies is that there's just so much overlap. So when we have a large group and we can do this statistical analysis, we can um, come up with some trends. But if you're the individual patient here, it's very hard to know where do you fall? Are you on the yellow green line or are you on the blue line? And we don't have a good way to reliably separate the two groups. So another um, technique is called diffusion tensor imaging or DTI, and it measures changes in the tissue based on how water moves um, and how the disease disrupts the normal biological barriers. So um, this is an MRI performed in a common vegetable celery. And we can see that it doesn't really tell us much about the structure of the celery, but from eating it, you know that there's these long channels in it that are kind of fibrous and that's how the water moves through the celery. But if we add DTI, now we can see those structures um, quite clearly. So when you apply this to the brain, then we can map all the different fiber tracks within the brain and it can help us understand where the neurons are going and how things are connected, or if these have been disrupted. There's a lot of different metrics that can be derived from this data. Um, the diff diffusivity um, and fractional anisotropy. So in a study, um, this was done, a study done in football players where they put an accelerometer on their helmets to measure um, over the course of a season, um, you know, how many hits did they get and what were the forces that were exerted? Um, and then they also looked at like, did they have any clinical symptoms of concussion or were they kind of thought to be okay? And this study showed that there is decreased uh, fractional anisotropy in the cortical spinal tract, which is the main um, kind of motor tracked and that um, happened over a single season of playing. Um, the decrease also correlated to the amount of force. So if somebody had more blows, then um, the decrease was larger. Um, and then this decrease in fractional anisotropy um, also correlated with a um, biomarker in the serum called tau, which can be seen in other neurodegenerative processes like Alzheimer's disease. And so here's a graph of each patient, over, or sorry, each football player over the course of the season and pre and post season, we can see that there's a trend, like they're all sloping down and to the right. So fractional anisotropy decreased in most of the players. There are a few people, however, though, that it did go up. Um, and then in looking at patient, um, players who actually had a diagnosis of a concussion or traumatic brain injury during the season, um, when we take the average of all these patients, the mean or the average here in the middle is lower than the average of the normal healthy controls. But again, there's so much variation in these groups and they're overlapping. Um, unless you're way down here, it's really hard to distinguish um, the difference between these two groups on a on an individual level. So another approach that has, has been tried is resting state fMRI. And um, to do resting state fMRI, um, you're in the MR scanner and we'll have the patient fixate on either a like image of a cross and just try and focus on the image, but not really thinking or doing anything specifically. Or another instruction we can give them is just close your eyes and let your mind wander. Um, and we're looking at um, neurovascular coupling um, and how blood flow is impacted in the brain. And then from this, we can derive measurements of how connected different portions of the brain are together, or how much they're signaling and talking to each other. And when we do this sort of analysis, um, there's a couple of things that we can see. So one is the default mode network. 
Um, and this is more active during rest than during tasks that require your attention and focus. And it's thought to be like that kind of like, how do you know um, if something startles you or wakes you up um, that your brain, even if you're not paying attention to it, that it's still kind of paying attention to things. Um, and then there's also other networks like the motor network, um, which is responsible for moving your body and doing tasks. Um, so for uh, resting state fMRI, they looked at um, people with minor head trauma. And this was defined as a Glasgow Clima scale between 13 to 15. So 15 would be completely normal and 13 is kind of mildly reduced, but these people would still be alert and able to answer questions, but maybe they were a bit confused or drowsy um, after the injury. And um, during this study, again, there were group level differences when we averaged everybody together, but it's very hard to um, apply this to each individual. So this is an example of the um, default mode network in a healthy brain. And then this is the connectivity that we see in um, mild traumatic brain injury. So we're not seeing those large areas of activation that we're seeing in the healthy controls. So another kind of more complex version of this analysis includes um, graph theory, where it's trying to model some of these connections. Um, so we have multiple different nodes in the brain and they connect to a central hub so all these are kind of working together and then the hubs can connect to different hubs farther away, which might be connected to a whole bunch of nodes. And these form a very complex pathway. Um, we can do mathematical models of this to look at how many nodes are there, how many nodes connect to each hub, how many hubs are connected to each other, what is the distance between all these connections, and then what degree of like clustering or how many of these are kind of working together doing um, similar tasks. And so using this approach, um, there is a global increase in the connectivity eight days post-concussion relative to normal controls. Um, and this is thought to be that there's recruitment of additional neural resources to enable communication following disruption of network. So um, the brain has realized that certain neurons or activities are not happening. And then um, there, the connectivity is increased to try and compensate for it. Um, Another finding was that in patients with traumatic brain injury, um, the brain is more connected to itself locally. So those short um, connections are seen more often, but then the path, the longest path between disconnections is longer. So it shows us that we do understand how some of these connections are altered, but I don't think we fully understand the meaning of this, um, is it is this basically plasticity in the brain um, changing the way it's going to work, or is this just a temporary phenomenon? Is there any way that we can use this to predict who might recover or who might have more difficulty in their recovery? Um, another technique is magnetoencephalography, and here's a patient sitting in the scanner. And it's a technique that maps brain activity by measuring magnetic fields. And the, the electrical currents generate the magnetic fields. These are pretty small, so that's why there's a very large scanner over the patient's head. Um, but this can be detected with these very sensitive magnometers. So magnetoencephalography, or MEG, has been applied to mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and it's found that patients with a history of traumatic brain injury have abnormal slow waves that can be measurized, sorry, measured um, and localized. And this low wave generation happens in a few specific areas. Um, it was seen particularly in the uh, frontal and prefrontal regions, and that can manifest as changes in personality, difficulty concentrating, 
um, changes in their mood um, or depression. And these slow waves are thought to be due to cortical deafferentiation or um, injury to the axons that are connecting to the brain cortex. And so this was a review article looking at several studies of MEG. And again, similar to the other modalities, um, they conclude that there is potential, but it's still not um, specific enough for an individual patient. It shows us these differences on a population level, but we're really trying to hone down on how do we um, diagnose or treat a specific individual patient. So another aspect that we can look at is blood flow in the brain. Um, so a technique that we can use to do this is called cerebrovascular reactivity. And in this study, we use um, a special MRI sequence that looks at blood flow. Um, and then we give a vasodilatory stimulus um, to try and dilate the blood vessels so we can tell like how healthy are they? Can they react really quickly and robustly? or are they a bit more slow and sluggish? Um, and what we use for this test is just carbon dioxide. So this can be done just by holding your breath um, or we can administer it through a mask. There's also other medications that we can use and inject in the arm um, to cause that vasodilation. And this is a map of cerebrovascular reactivity. This is from a normal atlas. So this is many brains averaged together on a standardized map. Um, and we can see that positive cerebrovascular reactivity is shown in kind of red, orange, and it's higher in the cortex. And then the yellow colors are a bit lower in the white matter. Um, so kind of similar to the pattern that we see on SPECT, which is also looking at blood flow. Um, and then you can also compare this to a normal atlas, um, kind of like the SPEC study, um, and look at how many standard deviations um, is this above or below normal. So here, if they're within one standard deviation, we're not showing any color. And then a lot of this light blue is between one to two standard deviations. But like I said before, we really want to see changes that are below two standard deviations before we're starting to call things abnormal versus just within the spectrum of normal. Um, so this was a study using CBR um, to look at patients who had had a prior concussion, and they were compared to a normal atlas of healthy controls. Um, and we can see that the concussion patients here, there's a lot more of that positive CBR, red, yellow, um, compared to the normal controls. Um, and the area under the curve for this test was 0.9 and 0.93, which is very good. A perfect test would have an area under the curve of one, and then a test that was no better than flipping a coin would be along the screen line here. So this is actually quite sensitive in uh, differentiating um, patients with concussion versus healthy controls. Um, and then when we break it down a little bit more, there were two things that were actually significant. One was that the magnitude of response was higher in the patients compared to the controls. But then the other was also that the speed of the response was also faster than in normal controls. So um, like the other study I was talking about earlier, it seems like the brain is reacting in a kind of overexcited or overactive manner, um, as opposed to almost all other pathologies we see decreased magnitude of response and decreased speed of response. So this is very unique to concussion. So if patients have other conditions, um, as many people do, this might be better to try and differentiate um, concussion from other conditions. Um, so as I said, yes, the blood vessels are faster and stronger than normal. Um, I, I guess I already said kind of this. Um, I think the issue of comorbidities and other diseases still needs to be assessed further. Um, we don't always have um, just one diagnosis. It's a possibility if people have other medical history. So 
the status of advanced neuroimaging, it's this dilemma between the individual patient and then a lot of these research studies are done on large populations. And despite all these really advanced techniques and sophisticated analysis, we're still not able to um, apply this uh, to individual patients. So how can we do better? Is there a better biomarker? How do we figure out um, things on an individual level? So some of this might involve integrating a couple of these different approaches into kind of one model where we take structural data and functional great data and integrate all of that, maybe with some clinical biomarkers um, and put together a very complex model of this complex process. Um, this is incredibly challenging. Um, there are some people that have been studying this in nematode brains, um, and they've been successful on that level. But the problem is the nematode brain only has 300 neurons versus we have 85 billion neurons. So it's a lot more complex to do this sort of thing in humans. Um, but this might be changing in the future. Um, as our computational abilities increase, and there's new um, AI-driven algorithms that can help do some of these complex analysis. This might be possible in the future. So um, we can learn from approaches to understanding other diseases in CNS. So another condition that has typically a normal MRI is schizophrenia. Um, so this group applied um, a very complex AI model um, to patients with schizophrenia versus normal controls. And they looked at the structural MRI and the functional MRI. And then this is really quite a, a very intense analysis with a lot of different components that were analyzed. And they put it into their AI machine to do the analysis. And in the end, they got some very impressive results. And they found that when they integrated all this data, they were able to have an accuracy in diagnosing schizophrenia of up to about 99%. Um, so this was compared to the um, clinical diagnosis as the gold standard. So um, the correlation is almost 100%. And so it means that this model can identify them nearly as well as um, clinicians can. The problem with this approach is the AI is a bit of a black box. Um, how it's making the final judgment and what inputs are using can sometimes be kind of opaque, especially when you have such a complex model that's really hard for us to kind of conceptualize if there's a thousand different relationships between all these different variables that we can't really conceive of that in our mind, but the AI can. Um, and so there's been some problems with AI studies in the past. Like one of the first studies that was done in radiology looked at chest x-rays in the emergency room and they wanted to try, or sorry, just chest x-rays. And they were trying to identify pneumonia. And the first AI was doing a pretty good job at identifying patients with pneumonia, but then they had it project like a heat map over the image of what was the features of the image that it was looking for. So ideally you'd want to see that heat map over the area of pneumonia in the lung. And one of the little hotspots was actually on the patient location. So the name and the patient location and other information is usually in the top corner of the images. And the AI realized if the patient was in the ER, they were much more likely to have pneumonia than somebody who was coming from an outpatient clinic. So you can use AI, but you have to really be careful and understand how exactly is it working? What data is it using? And then your AI algorithm is only as good as um, the data that you're training it on. So um, in this case, the gold standard was um, clinical diagnosis by a psychiatrist, but sometimes clinical medicine is challenging and we, we might not be perfect in identifying those patients either. So there's still a lot of challenges to go.
Um, one potential approach is can we add any kind of biomarkers to imaging? Um, and so there's some serum markers in either like blood or CSF. And these are proteins um, that can be seen in the setting of um, CNS injury. Um, but a lot of the studies have, again, focused on the group level and not individual patient levels. Um, and technically, these aren't specific to just traumatic brain injury. You can see some of these in other um, neurodegenerative processes as well. So um, it could be a red flag if a patient has a, a comorbid medical condition that um, impacts one of these. Um, so the study of these different molecules is called proteomics and a study, a very large study of a lot of different potential um, biomarkers. There were 1400 um, different proteins that were screened. Um, and this study looked at adolescent teenage hockey players, um, 11 who had a history of concussion and 24 who played but didn't have any um, clinical symptoms. And this study showed and that there were three proteins that were um, significantly different in the concussed players versus the non-concussed. But then once they created a bit more complex model integrating the three of them, they had a very good area under the curve of 0.98. Um, so this shows tremendous potential. So AI will have a major impact on imaging and proteomics, and maybe this might be um, the final like kind of key that we're looking for to bring the diagnosis down to a specific patient rather than just on a population level. Um, and it might help us understand the biology of concussion more um, and understand this incredibly complex structure of the brain that we're trying to understand. It might help us understand who is going to recover versus who might um, have symptoms that persist. Um, and one of the big challenges will always be um, differentiating is this um, changes that we're observing due to concussion or another disease that could have similar features. So in summary, the brain is incredibly complex and delicate. Um, in concussion, traditional conventional imaging with CT and MRI should be normal. Um, despite these patients um, not having any imaging findings, they can still have severe and persistent symptoms. Advanced neuroimaging can see the findings, but only when compared to a group of normal controls, and it's not yet diagnostic at an individual patient level. With the advances in um, computing and artificial intelligence, um, maybe we'll be able to understand these complex processes better in the future. And thank you for listening to me. Dr. Perra, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, a lot of really great information. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, remind you, if you have any questions or a few that we have already, if you do have any that you want um, Dr. Perra to address, just enter those in the Q&A. Um, so Dr. Perra, the first question is, how do you know if you had a more severe form of injury unless you have an MRI, which they usually don't do for people with concussion? Um, I think it would probably come down to the clinical assessment and discussion of symptoms and kind of what the injury was. Um, as I said, the vast majority of people have normal imaging, but we do imaging kind of in the cases where we're not sure and we think that maybe the symptoms might be severe enough or the mechanism of injury was severe enough um, that they might be at risk for kind of a more severe injury or a traumatic brain injury. Um, so it's not routinely done. Um, but like I said, it kind of helps rule out that there's more severe injury and that we're dealing with concussion and not something else. Um, part of the problem is because we don't have the perfect test to say, yes, you have a concussion. No, you don't have a concussion. So, um, it's still driven a lot by more of the clinical factors than using the MRI or one of the other techniques I was trying to talk about um, to rule in or out concussion. Great, thanks so much. Um, 
Heather's asking, I have had a brain injury uh, since September 2019 and haven't had any imaging uh, and is asking, should I push to have an MRI to have to get a baseline? Uh, and it sounds like she's still symptomatic, saying she's not still not able to work. I guess I don't want to give medical advice in this chat, no. um, but as I said, kind of with respect to the other question is that it's kind of a discussion with your physician about um, like, is there a diagnostic question? Like, are they very sure about the diagnosis or were there some things um, that weren't exactly clear? Like I said, if people have a history of other medical conditions that could potentially confound the picture, um, maybe then imaging could help sort it out. But as I said, a lot of times it doesn't really push us one way or the other. Um, so until we get kind of a better test that we can say like with 98% sensitivity and specificity, that's still why um, we don't really have a really good go-to. And even if we do an MRI, it might not always provide the answer that people are looking for. Great, thanks so much. Um, we have someone asking, are there any imaging results that relate to common concussion symptoms like dizziness or headaches? So those are really common symptoms that people have after concussion, and there's no specific imaging finding that correlates with them. Um, so it, those are basically a clinical diagnosis, not an imaging diagnosis. Um, when we're doing imaging in the context of like headache, usually we're looking to rule out other things. Like, is there a bleed? Is there a mass or a tumor or um, another condition like hydrocephalus where there's too much um, cerebral spinal fluid in, the, in parts of the brain? Um, so once we rule out all of those, um, then we can't really say like what's causing the headache. And so another condition that's kind of similar is migraine, where a lot of times we do imaging because we're worried, you know, could this be a mass or something else? But the imaging in migraine is normal, just like in concussions. So it can be pretty frustrating, I think, as a patient that you still don't really have like kind of the, the validation of saying like, yes, this says I have a concussion. Um, Dizziness is similar. Like we see a lot of patients with vertigo for and dizziness for many different causes. And again, we usually do some sort of, or sometimes we do some imaging to rule out things that could be causing it like a stroke. But if it's, if we don't see an obvious cause, it doesn't mean that the patient's still not dizzy. It doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have a headache. Um, so these aren't, we don't really have a good test for these conditions. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question. I noticed you had some studies, uh, the vascular performance metrics with both male and female groups. Can you speak more to the theory and if there are more differences by sex that are being studied? It's quite challenging. Um, a lot of studies are not done with a very diverse patient population. Um, particularly often historically women have been excluded from a lot of studies because they were worried about changes in the menstrual cycle and estrogen and how that could be affecting studies. But half of our population is women. We need to be studying the entire population. We also need to be studying people of different backgrounds, um, to really understand, um, the whole population and not just a certain segment of the population. Um, in terms of uh, differences between genders, um, in some conditions, there are differences, but I don't think that this is really well understood. Like for the blood vessel reactivity, um, the small differences that we're seeing um, are not incredibly statistically significant. So there was a slight trend, but these studies are hard in getting enough patients um, to really be able to reliably differentiate it. And um, certain things like blood flow, I don't think we would expect there to be any significant difference um, because I guess 
everybody's brain needs blood flow to, to function. So there isn't really a reason that there would be a gender difference there. Okay, great. Um, we have another one. My MRI post-concussion by about four months showed small non-specific white matter T2 hyperintensities. And this was brushed off by the neurologist as normal. I've been curious about that. So I guess wondering if, if that's something you would expect. So a lot of patients have findings on MRI um, that are called these white matter hyperintensities. And typically they're just very small dots, kind of one to three millimeters. And we can see these in um, the context of like prior trauma and concussion and traumatic brain injury. We can also see them as a consequence of kind of normal aging. We can see them related to vascular disorders such as stroke or small vessel disease. Um, and that's commonly seen in patients who have vascular risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, or a sedentary lifestyle. Um, migraine is another condition that affects the blood vessels. And then if there's dysregulation and blood flow that can cause some of these changes as well. So all these different disease processes can cause kind of that converge on the same end pathway that is these um, kind of, we sometimes call them unidentified bright objects or UBOs. Um, and that we don't, we see the white dot, but we can't tell you what caused it specifically. Um, so then we try and put together some clinical history, like how old is the patient? Do they have any of those vascular risk factors? Have they had a prior injury? Do they have a history of migraine? And from that, we can try and attribute what might be the underlying cause. Um, sometimes things can have a bit more characteristic appearance that might lean you one way or the other, but a lot of times it's kind of nonspecific. Okay, thanks so much. How would you recommend a patient go about getting a functional MRI? What hospitals or clinics offer them? So right now, functional MRI isn't being used clinically for concussion. So that would only be on like a research basis as part of like a clinical trial. Um, we do do functional MRI for other conditions like um, mapping language before epilepsy surgery, but it's not routinely done clinically for concussion. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lori is asking, what imaging can be used to look at the C1 and C2 atlas to see about cervical instability and whether that might be a reason for people's dizziness during concussion or after concussion? Um. So usually what we do to look at the cervical spine in the context of trauma is you can either do x-rays or a CT. Um, so often when people come into the emergency room, we'll do a CT of the head and of the cervical spine, um, depending on, again, the, the story and what injuries they had. Um, and that can look for things like fractures and broken bones. It can also sometimes show um, injuries to the soft tissues and ligaments. Um, but in terms of instability in the general population, just from one injury, uh, I don't think that we would see a lot in that scenario. A lot of people who have instability, it's going to be a very significant trauma or they're gonna have some other medical condition, um, like one of them is rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so in terms of for you, if there be anything that would be indicated, again, that's a discussion with your patient, um, your physician about your specific situation, but it wouldn't be something that we routinely are looking for. Okay, great. Um, we've got one more here. Um, my son had a concussion in March, 2021, was told it was a small concussion. Uh, however, after several months and now years of symptoms and therapy, another non-contrast image was done. And we were told he had a thinning of his semicircular, if I'm going to pronounce this right, dehiscence, uh, which might contribute to his audiology issues. 
Uh, could they not have seen this previously? And how will this impact him since it was missed before? Any thoughts? So it's, it's hard to say um, with respect to like a new finding that wasn't seen before. I'm not sure if the same test was done, but there's a lot of different ways we can do MRI and a lot of different imaging sequences that we can acquire. So there is a specialized sequence that we use to look at the temporal bones um, kind of here where all the structures related to hearing are. But again, that's a special dedicated sequence. So that might not have been included on the previous imaging. Um, usually we would look at those structures, like you said, if there's more of a history of dizziness or hearing changes to screen for any um, underlying abnormalities. Things like superior um, dehiscence of the superior semicircular canal is a congenital um, uh, variant. Like some people are just born with it. Um, it's not typically something seen in association with concussion, but maybe if they have this variant anatomy and then they have an injury on top of that, maybe that could um, contribute to symptoms in that individual person. Um, but usually in terms of the temporal bones and concussion, we're looking for more signs of trauma, like skull fractures or dislocation of the ossicles, the little bones in your ear that let you hear. Um, and then, like I said, looking for other congenital variations that could maybe be contributing. Great. Thank you so much. I think we've actually, we've come to the end of our questions and we're almost right at time. So that worked out well. Um, thanks again, Dr. Para. That was excellent, really excellent talk. Oh, okay. I see one more. Uh, someone is commenting that they had the white spots or hyper intensities on MRI two weeks post concussion. And when the MRI was repeated about two years after, they weren't there anymore. I guess, just looking for your comment on that. Yeah, so when I talked about the white matter hyperintensities before, um, like I said, they're a common pathway that could be seen as a result of many underlying conditions. But then there's another phenomenon where sometimes there's healing and they go away, or maybe there's atrophy of the adjacent brain and then they are less visible to us later on. Maybe if we were to look on like a pathology level, we might still see some of those changes, but they're no longer apparent on the imaging. And this is another phenomenon that we see quite often, but we don't fully understand why it's happening. So the two kind of main theories are, is that the brain has healed or we just can't see those changes as well as we used to. Um, and again, the significance of that, we don't know. Okay. And are there any current studies going on at UHN or in Toronto that you're aware of or that you'd recommend to concussion patients? Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, there are a lot of different studies going on, but I'm not, um, I can't give specific recommendations of which ones would be recruiting what specific patients um, for those opportunities. So. Um, I'm not sure about that one. Okay, no problem. All right. Well, I think we are definitely uh, at time now. So thank you uh, again. Uh, just to everyone watching, as always, though, there will be a very short survey that comes your way. Uh, so if you have a minute, um, if you can fill that out, we're always open to your feedback, your suggestions. Um, on occasion, people will put a question in, but just know that if we don't have your contact information, um, so you can always put your email because the, the surveys come in and they're anonymous. We don't know who we're getting them from. So, um, and I just want to make note of the fact that we'll be back in two weeks and we are going to have Dr. Christine Dalton uh, with us. Uh, and she is going to be speaking to optometry post-concussion. So hope to see you back in a couple of weeks and hope everyone has a great evening. Thanks again.